That's all power of the moon. We have already seen that there is but one basic energy behind all movement. All desires, all emotions, all thoughts. We use this energy in any way we please. We set this energy in motion through thought, emotion, desire, and indeed there are many movements which act upon the body. I often think that this force we could use like electricity. We condition electricity. It's an energy, but we do not know what this energy is. We call it electricity. No one has ever seen electricity, but we know that it is because we can use it. And we condition this electricity to light by putting a globe in, we condition it to light. We condition it by putting it through generator, a wireless, x-ray, and a hundred, probably a thousand different ways we can condition electricity. So do we condition this light energy which in itself as a basic principle, unconditioned, free and natural. We condition it through emotion, desire and thought. We direct it through these particular forms that we ourselves create. Therefore, we condition light, this light that is free and natural. <coughs> I like the word movement because it conveys through meaning what takes place. In every thought, every motion, every desire, there is movement in one direction or another according to the nature of thought, motion, of desire. In every emotion and desire, the thought becomes a central figure in both. Therefore, it is our thought we must deal with if we are to express our true nature. All emotions and desires are mental currents. There are two different kinds of mental currents, although only one force underlies both. We have the current that acts against us and the current that acts in our favor. But the basic energy is the same. We change it, we condition it. Therefore, we must learn and understand what we are doing. And we find that this movement takes place in ourselves. We condition then this energy to our emotions, to our thoughts, to our desires. And initially we deserve what we are doing. We become aware of the fact that we are conditioning this energy in different movements, these movements affect us in one way, sometimes negatively, and in another way affect us positively. <coughs> Nevertheless, it's the same. And I always think that even if it is a positive or, or negative movement, these are experiences in our lives. And as long as we discern, discern, and the cause of even the positive and the negative are the same to us when we discern, because we are neither affected by one or the other. We discern the cause. We discern our own conditioning of this energy, and we are able then to stand and look upon it as a relative thing. These conditions are relative to you. They are relative to the individual. And immediately you see that they are relative to you, then you have power over them because you deserve them. But if you are caught up in them, in the swill of this mood, in the swill of this emotion, the swill of this desire, the swill of your thoughts, then you are caught up in them, up in them, and you are conditioned because you are bound by the conditions you create. Now I want to see. It is certainly true that we ourselves are the creators of all things in our relative world, to our minds, to our thoughts, to our emotions, to our desires. 
I want you to see this clearly. Because unless you see this clearly, then you'll be caught up in these things. It is to free you from these things that I have come to show you the importance of this wonderful truth. There is no limit to the number of emotions. Let us name some. Impatience. You're caught up in impatience. You're caught up in anger. You're caught up in hate. In hate. You're caught up in indulgence. You're caught up in jealousy. You're caught up in egotism. You're caught up in fear. You're caught up in selfishness. Approbation. Vanity. Terror. Dread. Dismay. Panic. Fright. Etc. And because you're caught up in them, they act against you. Then there is the great emotion that acts in our favor, which is love. And that is the most extraordinary thing. <coughs> that when love is manifesting in its true nature, there is never any fear. There is never any hate. There is never any indulgence. There is never any jealousy. There is never any echoism. There is never any fear or selfishness or approbation or vanity or terror or dread or dismay or panic or flight. But love in its true nature is fine. I mean love, not possessiveness. You have to pass through, push that state of possessiveness to not understand love. Before you can arrive at that which is true with a cat. <laughs> then you stand alone. You stand above everything. In fact, true love is seeing all the dimensions at one and the same time. Seeing every angle up, discerning everything in its true place without being caught up in it. Even love in its rational sense, you can be caught up in that. You can be caught up in the love of possessiveness. You can be caught up in that. But when you have this state that I am showing, where neither any of these things can affect you, you are standing, seeing all dimensions at one and the same time. You are free. You never condition us. You don't condition anything because love itself is and must be the primary factor, the creative <coughs> principle behind every movement that is constructive throughout the whole movement. Exist in the atom. Exist in the electron. Exist in the molecule. It exists in every formation. It's the binding quality. The quality that creates the perfect expression of the infinite created being. That being infinite must be perfect because it is eternal. That which is eternal must be infinite. And that which is eternal must be perfect. Little do we know that the body is the sounding board for all these emotions. And according to their intensity, so are, so are we affected. Think of your organs making a certain sound when aroused by any of these emotions. Your heart beats faster, your breathing apparatus is checked, your sweat glands pour out liquid, your stomach turns over, your intestines rumble, your tear glands weep. All these vibrations, if all these vi vibrations were to be heard by the ear, it would cause a discord beyond our imagination. Yet these organs really cry out in vain for relief. These organs begin to talk back to the body, talk back to the mind. These organs talk back to the mind through the cerebellum, where this, this behavior begins. 
Where this misbehavior has been created through your emotional habit patterns. An emotion that is continuous, that is continually engaged in, becomes a habit. And that emotional habit pattern begins to express itself in some form or whatever throughout your organism and your body. Sometimes it is your stomach, sometimes it is your, your esophagus, sometimes it is your skin, sometimes it is your ears. And it can be any portion of the body for the emotional habit back patterns expressed. That is the sound. Your body becomes the sounding board in things. The sound. I always think that it is necessary to realize that eating is also the most important thing. Because you can't put a square meal into a round stomach. I said to a patient of mine the other day, he came to me and he was back. As broad as he was long, and I knew perfectly well what he was doing, he was eating far too much. And he had always been with symptoms of a chap that was eating twice as much as he should eat. So I said to him, Your trouble is you're putting a square meal into a run of stomach, and it can't go. <laughs> Like a chap was standing in the spot with the street, you know, the fellow standing on the street the other day, and he had a revolver in one hand and a knife in the other. So a chap runs up to him and says, You'll be, you be, you be arrested, you can't have a revolver in one hand and a knife in the other. Well, he says, I was just wondering, he says, whether I'll shoot across the street or cut the corner. <laughs> <laughs> The combination, the combinations of the organs' behavior are limitless in number. There are those which harmonize our organs and those which cause disharmony. Most of these are not caused by reaction to physical danger, but by reaction to events, people, and things. This, with this, the result that we deliberately create the disturbance in our working organism, all these effects arise out of situations affecting our adjustment to a confused world of confused people, with the result that many people are on the verge of a nervous breakdown caused by our homemade nervous tension. Now, what does that mean? We see then that we are not fearing physical danger. Our reaction is not so much to physical danger all the time, but our reactions are to events, people, and things. With the result that we become confused. The world is confused. The people are confused. And we are reacting to a confused world full of confused people. If you then continue to react to these things, you are caught up in your own emotions, your own thoughts, your own desires. And that's what I am trying to show you how you can prevent this. And you can prevent it only by learning what you are doing. Have you, ever, have you ever examined in your mind, in your own mind, the many situations that would make you angry, jealous, or excite the emotion of love? Your heart, your glands, your stomach, and lungs are in a continual uproar. No wonder you suffer from all different complaints. In this lesson, I want to help you to discern these thoughts, emotions, and motives that are continually causing you your organism to break down. When you realize that from every emotion or desire you can extract a mighty power, you have discovered a gold mine within yourself. That's when these emotions begin to rise up within you. 
the energy is already began to move in the direction. The movement is according to your thought, your emotion, your desire. The movement is set in action. You have already caused the energy to be active. <coughs> now there's only one principle of energy. And how are we then to change the polarity of this energy once we have aroused it? So that this energy does not affect us destructively. But we can use it after it is aroused and directed into channels that will aid and help us. <coughs> There is tremendous force in every emotion. You must not then suppress an emotion. If there is a tremendous force in an emotion, and you suppress that emotion, unknowingly, you are only creating trouble for yourself. If that emotion is a movement, in the wrong direction. Are you suppressing? Do you think that you have destroyed or altered that movement? No, it continues to move in that direction. But immediately you become aware of it, thereby changing the polarity of the energy. to work for you and not against you. You are the director of this energy. You are the director of the movement that takes place in your body. But you can only do that when you become aware of your own awareness. That seems Greek, does it not? Think about it for a little while <coughs> and you will see how magnificent it is. Become aware of your own awareness and then become aware of the movement you have created. You being a director can change that movement into any way you will. The energy being aroused goes forward in the direction that you direct but you can only do so when you become aware of it and not caught up in it. We have two nervous systems that function at one. It being interlocked with the other. Also that functions are different. They act toward one end. One nervous system deals with the external and the other with the internal. One deals, as it were, with, with, as you call this, the, the external things. The, this organism here, which we call the cerebrum. Otherwise, we call it the cerebrospinal nervous system. And the other one we call the sympathetic nervous system, which originates in the cerebellum. These two are linked together by what was known as sensory, sensory nerves. <coughs> Motor or sensory nerves. So that your thoughts passing through the cerebrospinal system is caught up through the sensory and motor nerves and the sympathetic nervous system takes it up and performs exactly what you think and feel. And it is this organism that tells you what you feel. So the body begins to talk back to the brain and the cerebellum begins to tell the cerebrum what it feels. And therefore, if you do not know what's going on, then the vicious circle is in operation because you do not understand. But once you understand the mechanism that I am showing you, you will soon find out that you can direct the energy 
You can change the polarity because you are the director, because you have become aware. If you do not know the difference between the real and the false, then you are lost in your emotion. When you are aware of our true nature, our nervous system sends impulses that harmonize the result being that we build healthy bodies. Relaxation is natural harmony. <coughs> I'm not going to go before, I sh before my time, I mean to say, later on we will have to deal with relaxation in all its aspects. And I'm not going to talk too much about relaxation at the present time, because we haven't, this course doesn't deal with it, but we'll deal with it later. <coughs> but what I want to tell you is this. I said before, when you take off the brakes, nature does the work. Why? It is very simple. And life is unconditioned. I told you then that we condition life through our emotions, our desires, our thoughts, and by these we cause tension through the nervous system that is our picture upon the body. Our muscles become tense, uh, they cause pressure on various vital centers. When we see that the external muscles are tense, we know perfectly well that the internal muscles are tensed also. We have conditioned life. We have put life in a cage. What do you do then? You must relax. Conscious relaxation then tends to break up the tension and break up these habit patterns you have created through conditioning life. To better understand the mechanism of these reactions, I will give you a short summary of the brain, the nervous system, and how they act. Realizing always that this organism is definitely under the control of the mind and will of consciousness. When what consciousness is aware of, so does this simple yet complicated organism of brain and nerves act accordingly. The brain is divided into four major parts, all working separately, yet all interlocked in their action. There is a frontal or higher brain we call the cerebral. We think through these. We reason. It's the brain that does all the knowing. It thinks, it reacts to external things and decides. You use it to read with, and all that the consciousness is aware of comes through the cerebrum, the frontal brain. Then we have the cerebellum, the lower brain. This portion of your brain is the part that feels higher brain interprets the situation and sends it on to the lower brain for feeling and action. The lower brain or cerebellum sends its messages in turn to the higher brain in terms of how it feels about the situation. When you are elated, calm or depressed, when you have nervous reactions, fear, etc., when you have an upset heart or stomach, it is the cerebellum that tells you what it feels, what is going on in the body. The cerebellum or lower brain is the controller, coordinating all the functions of the body. It keeps the heart, lungs, stomach, circulation of the blood, glands, muscles, etc., all working together as one team. And when the cerebellum is free from misbehavior, 
This behavior, mind you, created by your own emotional habit patterns. The organs work smoothly and easily because they are coordinated properly because of a free cerebellum. But if there is misbehavior in the cerebellum, then there is interruption. Then there is misbehavior in the organs and the coordinating quality has been lost. When you are hungry, it's the lower brain that tells you about it. And when you become aware of food, through the higher brain, this message is telegraphed to the lower, and the whole body becomes active. The digestive juices begin to flow, etc., ready to receive the food. You notice when dog, <coughs> when a plate of dinner is put down below it, beside it, and it is held back for a moment, you see the saliva running from its mouth. It sees the food, cerebellum, and the cerebrum sends the message to the cerebellum. The cerebellum, the coordinating power of the body, causes the glands to throw out the necessary substance for the digestion of the food. When you see food on the table and you're hungry, the brain tells the cerebellum what it is. The cerebellum then prepares the whole of the organs of the body to become ready for to receive the food. It is this same force of the brain that becomes active through various emotions and these are reflected upon the body. This organ reports what is going on in your body to the higher brain. When the nervous tension, when in a nervous tension your heart beats fast, your knees tremble, your hands shake, your stomach does convulsions, it's the lower brain that tells you what is happening. You do not run because you fear. You fear because you run. If you think out that, you will see how to it. The more you run, the greater the fear, because you're caught up in it. So we see then, these are the two, what we call major organizations of the nervous system that control the mechanism of the body. Now we have what we call the medulla. It's the organ that is like a telephone exchange. All the wires, all the nerves, passing on the messages <laughs> to each and every part of the body. All nerves pass through this wonderful part of the brain, and each organ gets its message accurately. There is no slip in the exchange, no double connection. <laughs> this then for all the nerves move in the body. But each has its own sheet. Each passes through its complete compartment and is sent on to every part of the body. Each different message is carried separately to that part of the body. A most wonderful, organized nervous system. Who could create it? but the infinite himself, the great intelligence of the human. Life then created the body and can reorganize the body. Life that is unconditioned created the body for its own self-expression. Now comes the master control from above. <coughs> and sent in the center of the brain Dividing the front to or higher from the lower, there is what is called the corpus callosum. The masters speak of this as the spirit nuclei. 
the spirit new glory, and through this all cosmic truth comes, otherwise known as the thousand petal loads which situated above the head. In the drawing which you have seen of this petal lotus, thousand petal lotus, <coughs> it's like a trumpet that opens above the head and, as it were, vibrations of intelligence pour into this corpus colossal and there it is received in its true nature it's passed on to the brain to this portion of the brain here the cerebrum, the cerebrum where the cerebrum then takes hold of it and brings it and makes it into ideas of words and sounds that you can understand so in everything what is happening at this very moment is the same thing I am standing here I talk freely to you but many of the things I tell you I have never known before myself I only know them when I make them into words when I make them into words ideas of truth I have then conditioned this wisdom it comes through this practice philosophy and therefore I take hold of it through the vision brain of mine and form it into words and ideas that I hand out to you you pick it up also and you then with your own mind accept these things because you know it's true your experience tells you that what I tell you is true. The simplicity of this wonderful truth is beyond the understanding of the nature. So simple is the operation, yet so complicated in its nature that it's beyond our comprehension. It is in this portion of the brain <coughs> that knowledge and understanding is obtained without reason. In fact, this is the all-knowing center and when developed conveys knowledge exactly by means of inspiration to both the higher and lower brain, thereby influencing both and gives confidence to the higher and the lower is harmonized and calm the organization then receives the blessing of that all wisdom that is continually pouring into us when we open ourselves to it This wisdom then is unconditioned, free and natural, cures all conditions, it cleanses the mind, it takes all forms of negative vibration away, but because the consciousness becomes away, aware that of this wonderful power that neither knows good nor evil it does not know success or failure because it, these things are relative things it only knows itself to be true true in that truth then is life in that truth is freedom But as this center must be developed, and by the means I am using and teaching you, the process is gradual, yet firmly established. I will more to say about this later on as we come to this part of the course. <laughs> now I want to deal with the emotion of fear. That basic emotion that underlies all emotions that work against us. When man fears, he perceives some kind of danger to himself 
physically or mentally or socially. The next reaction is one of escape and how it can be accomplished. We are all seeking an escape from something. Unless we can discern the fact that we are seeking escape, an escape, we will never be able to eliminate it or will never be able to escape. For the simple reason that we are always caught up in our escape. But if we see what we are doing, and the means through which we are trying to escape, then we will dissolve it and we will be free. It is awfully true. <laughs> when you begin to discern the cause why you want to escape, then you have solved your problem. One man's danger is another man's everyday work. The man who works on the construction of a modern 100-story building structure and who leans against the wind would faint in the cage of lions. Yet the lion tamer would crawl on his belly and hang on in a frustrated fear. And hang on in frustrated fear even beyond despair. The riveter who catches red-hot rivets with ease would almost faint when asked to make a speech before an audience. How then would you cure the habit of fear? The men, first of all, who goes up on a hundred-story steel structure, <coughs> he didn't obtain his confidence all at once. It took him years of practice. So the river tank took years of practice. So the lion table took years of practice. So practice is the thing. Practice. Until you come familiar, then when you become familiar, your fear disappears. Fear of the unknown is the cause of most of your big fears. Something unknown. Something that's not tangible. Some the bridge that you never cross. But if then you do not understand this fear, these fears set up reflexes in the body creating disagreeable sensations, which create a strong secondary motive to find an escape. If Escape is impossible. These secondary feelings may become so intense as to produce paralysis, terrors, and how true that is. If we cannot find an escape, then we feel heavy. Our fear may paralyze us. Take, for instance, walking on an 18-inch plank along the floor. You can walk on it with perfect ease, 18 inches, from here to the end. But put that plank a hundred feet up in the air from one building to another, and then try to walk across it. See what would happen. Why can't you walk across the plank as easy, 100 feet up in the air from one building to another, and you can walk across the floor. Now, the cause of the fact that you have perfect confidence you will do it here, there is something to support you, but up there there is nothing. And your fear of thought is the fear that causes you, prevents you from walking across that plank hundred feet in the head, feet of God. The most of you then suffer from this fear. Fear of being unable to do a certain thing. 
you have not the confidence. But by practice, you do have the confidence. And that is to say, when you understand that, your fears at the beginning may be great, but as you practice, your fears become less and less, as long as you do not seek and escape. They immediately begin to seek and escape, then you have lost yourself. The person who walks across the plank will lie on his belly, and he'll struggle, even struggle on that, because he wants to escape from falling. You end your fear when you dissolve the cause and the process in operation. Suppose you hear a voice in the house. You're afraid of burden. If the noise you perceive is just a cat knocking something over, chasing a mouse, mouse your fear ends. But if uh, you did not deserve the cause, your fear might make you scream for help or even paralyze you. Later on we will deal with the means of banishing fear in time. Fear is a lack of confidence, a lack of understanding. Habit is a great antidote to fear. Fear of animals will disappear when you get the habit of working with them. Fear of climbing rocky bases will disappear when you get the thrill of climbing into your blood through habit. There are very few people in the world who climb rocky bases. I have climbed many in my time. I have climbed the Himalayas, but I have climbed even steeper mountains than that. I have climbed Mount Cook in New Zealand, which is one of the steepest and most dangerous mountains in all the world's climb. Although it's only 12,000 feet above sea level, its pinnacles of ice are almost perpendicular. And I know what thrills it used to give me when I used to pass and hang with my fingers on a ledge and look down hundreds of feet below and to see. It's a thrill, I tell you, it's a thrill. Perhaps I was old, the dear devil, but nevertheless, <laughs> that was bred in me, I suppose, when I was a boy. <laughs> was in my younger life, in my younger time, <laughs> that was nearly 50 years ago, I was out in the east. I was in the secret cell, in the east, away in the rain, in the air. And uh, I could tell you some tales of the escape that I had, yet it was all fun to me, fun. And I think that when you pass through those particular things, it gives you a feeling of confidence. I've been shot at, stabbed at, hit at, and all these sorts of things. Yes, when you realize the recognition of the truth. For instance, now in June the 21st, next month, I will be in my 73rd year, entering my 73rd year. And I don't look like 73 at this moment. <laughs> if, you, if you think about these things, then you will think that there must be something in it. And by God, there is something. There is more in it than you imagine. And I am pointing this way to you. I am surely point this way to you. <laughs> It is not running away that helps, but facing the situation and to establish the habit of facing everything, no matter what it may be. 
You generally hate, you generally hate the passion you have in just because you refuse to admit your fault. Therefore, you find something in that passion to hate. But you only injure yourself by doing so. All emotions such as hate, jealousy, selfishness, egotism, excessive vanity are influences that rise to the surface in the form of energy. You will note that this energy is working against you and not in your favor. To suppress this enemy in its present form does not relieve you, but only intensifies the condition. So therefore, if you these emotions arise and you suppress them, you haven't, you, you haven't done anything. You've only intensified that emotion and will rise again greater than before. You cannot destroy this movement by suppressing. Neither can you remove it by putting another in its place. You have to discern what you are doing. Then this same energy is transmuted and released through the realization of the fundamental life principle of love that is the foundation of all true expression and protection. Remember, reason thinking. Master every situation. Reason, think, master every situation. I remember one time, many years ago, in my exploits, <coughs> when I had passed, they told me, now you must be very careful, otherwise, you may be shot. You don't know what's going to happen to you one moment or another. And especially when you're asleep, hold your revolver in your hand and hold it in between your legs. Not hold it up, but down in between your legs, covered in the blanket. And hold it ready at any moment to shoot to protect yourself. So this went on. I did this for many nights and so forth until I got blue and woke tired. I got so, I got so bad, I got so, in this way, that I was afraid every night I went to bed, that I was going to be afraid that somebody was going to shoot me. And I began to have those sort of nightmares. I used to hear noises, jump up at once, and shoot. And I found that I was shooting in the air. So I took my revolver, and put it away, I was stuck. And from that moment, I never had another night. I was free. And that is the same with everyone. We are afraid. We support our fears by our actions. And we bring on the results. Reason thinking masters every situation. Hate is the most destructive movement in your body. It poisons the system and causes the blood to become impure. And there is another of a similar nature. All these emotions find their expression in body function. Jealousy is admission of failure. Ask yourself why you are jealous. Is it because some other person has qualities that you don't have? Or you believe you do not have? When you begin to admire what you see in others, we establish these things in ourselves. But if you get away from the relative, altogether into that which is real, you'll establish a sense of security that can never be attained through a belief in your personality, a belief in your own power, a belief in your capability, a belief in your so-called intellectualism, or you think that you have security in your administration or your job, whatever the case may be. There is no security in any of these relative things whatsoever. If you think that you have security because you're good-looking, or anything like that, you will find that it is not so. But if you know that life itself is unconditioned, is perfect in itself, 
And it is that life is expressing itself always. You can condition that life according to how you are aware. Your thought then becomes the focal part of the expression of life and you can direct it any way you please. We have light, we have power, we have electricity, we have all different forms, hundreds of different ways we are using electricity. <coughs> you can use light just the same way. Just the same. There are millions of lights in the city, but there's only one electricity that can be involved. There is only one light, even though there are millions of people, but there's only one light that is expressing itself through them all, and it's the same light. You are conditioning light, I am conditioning light. Yet when you know that it's free, there is freedom. After putting into operation what I have shown you, you will find a complete change taking place within yourself. Instead of having your heart, stomach, and glands in a continual uproar, you become a classic, well-organized individual ready for any, any eventuality. You will welcome temptation because you will understand this powerful mental force and use it to your advantage. To suppress to the supreme factor in this method that by the finally is to realize that there is no separation. The conception of ourselves being separate from divine life is the root of all our troubles. Let's say that again. The conception of ourselves being separate from divine life is the root of all our suffering. Every mental and emotional impulse implies a molecular action in the brain and in the twofold nervous system which controls every organ and cell in the body. Hence, we see, cause and effect in operation. The truth alone will be set O oh, great eternal one, thou hast made all plain to those who need thee. I was caught up in the gulf stream of emotion and carried to distant shores, yet there I found thee waiting to flee. O oh, great emotion of love, as I grasped thee with all my strength, I found that eternal spring of living water. I drank deeply and found the truth that love alone heals all wounds. Now I am drunk with thy ever-refreshing bar. Oh, my love. 